Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 58, I'm interviewed on the Green Root Podcast. In January, I was interviewed by Josh Schlossberg for his Green Root Podcast. Josh is an investigative journalist and recovering activist, and with this podcast, he is pursuing a quest to uncover the roots of the modern ecological crisis. I interviewed Josh in 2018 about how biomass energy isn't green, and you can read an abridged version online at my blog or the complete conversation in my book, Road Tripping at the End of the World. In this interview, we discussed some of the problems with agriculture, including habitat destruction, pesticides, chemical fertilizers, ocean dead zones, soil erosion, and topsoil loss. We also touched on small-scale farms versus big ag, and got into the issues with genetically modified crops. We then switched gears to history and prehistory, and examined how the agricultural revolution changed human culture and health for the worse. We ended by talking about the importance of taking our lead for the future from indigenous people. Green Root is one of my favorite podcasts, and I highly recommend that you check it out. See show notes for a link. And a big thank you to Josh for allowing me to issue this interview on my own podcast as well. Hey, everyone. This is Josh Schlossberg with the Green Root Podcast. For this episode, we're excited to have Colibri Ter Sonnenblum who is a writer and a podcaster who was an organic farmer for 10 years. Books include Adventures in Urban Bike Farming and The Failures of Farming and the Necessity of Wild Tending. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Josh. It's great to be here. Well, I am glad to be interviewing you because you interviewed me maybe, I don't know, two years ago or something like that. 2018. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever that was, three years ago. Who even knows at this point? A while in the prior eons, and uh, yeah, so I'm glad, glad to have you on the show to talk about some stuff. Seems like we're gonna we're gonna talk about some agriculture because that is a huge topic, and it's something that comes up peripherally on the podcast thus far, but I've never really delved into it for a whole interview. So let's talk a little bit about that. Why should people be concerned about agriculture? Like we have to eat, right? So what's the big deal? Right. Well, we definitely have to eat. That, that's definitely true. But how, how it is that we, that we are providing for that, of course, is the big question. You know, And when we look at contemporary agriculture as it is now, practice now, in the, in the, you know, especially in, in the so-called developed world, what we see is an industrial process that's going on, really. And it's an industrial process that is motivated primarily by the profit motive, not by the motive to feed people necessarily, right? Uh, The fact that our system can produce as much waste as it does every year uh, really points to that, you know? I mean, something like 40% of all food is, is, is wasted. So that shows us that it's not even really about trying to provide for people. It is bottom line trying to make money. Now, as, um, as a, as, as something that contributes to ecological destruction, uh, agriculture has a really big part that it plays. And the biggest way that we see that is just in, is first of all, in the, in just in the physical footprint of it, you know, just how much space it takes up, right? So if you've ever been to the Midwest of the United States and seen just the endless fields of corn and of soybeans, for example, I mean, basically, almost the entire state of Illinois, you know, Iowa, Ohio, you know, that that's really all there is. And then very large portions of Nebraska, the Dakotas, Kansas, you know, and in all these areas, what we're seeing there is former wildlife habitat. So this was some place where there were, uh, there was uh, native flora, native fauna, and native peoples as well, all in relationship, you know, to each other. So, you know, we talk about 
how, like I, I used to live in, in the Pacific Northwest, like you did too. And so I heard all about, you know, oh gosh, like 90 to 95% of the old growth trees are gone, right? Old growth forests, you know? Well, you go to the Midwest and you look at the prairies there and tall grass prairie is something like 97 to 99% gone. I mean, it's an even worse, you know, a level of ecological destruction that's happened there, you know? And, you know, with that was the buffalo, with the prairie dogs, you just had Deanna, Deanna Mayer, on, Mayer talking about that. And, you know, uh, and of course, all of those, there, there was, I mean, like any habitat, there was just an innumerable number of species that were all interacting with each other. And, you know, they're all gone, you know, at this point in those areas, you know. So, and then, you know, for people who have only been on the West Coast, say, driving through central, the Central Valley of California, that was all wetlands, you know, at one time, or a lot of it was wetlands, you know. And that all got drained, you know. And then you can go to places that are, that, you know, like further south in California to like the Salton Sea area, Imperial Valley area, there's a, a desert area that has been turned into farming, you know, by, you know, bringing in lots of irrigation, you know, and of course, irrigation is a whole nother topic to get into. But so, so I guess the first thing I would say about agriculture that we need to remember when it comes to its relationship to the environment is just every, every acre of, of farmland that you see is an acre of former wildlife habitat. Yeah, that's extremely crucial because I think some people don't really make that connection. And yeah, Deanna on the show a couple episodes ago, she really opened my eyes to that. I live at the edge of where grasslands still are. We do have some tall grass prairie here in Colorado, but yeah, it's pretty much all gone for the most part. And then as you head east, that was once basically like a prairie ocean. That's basically what it used to look like. And now it's right. kind of like a, an agricultural wasteland. So it's it's super important for people to understand that and, and to realize, yeah, it wasn't all just uh, corn and soybeans a uh, hundred years ago. It was uh, these really, really crucial ecosystems that maybe don't have the same wow factor as an old growth forest, but just as important. I think, and I think one of the reasons they don't have the wow factor of the old growth forest is because there's so little of it left. And so few people have even seen what is left, you know, yeah. because with, with an old growth forest, there is enough around, or there's also second growth forests that have come in that are old enough that they have something going on in them. I mean, people can imagine a forest, and then they can imagine an old growth forest. But when it comes to the prairies, there's there's not even, I mean, there's nothing left to go from at all with that. Like, personally, you know, I grew up in, in Nebraska, um, was born and raised there. I didn't visit an old growth prairie a remnant in Nebraska until 2018, that same road trip where I visited you in, in Colorado, you know, and I went and I went and saw one. And it was it was amazing. It was remarkable. It was really it was really one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen as a habitat. I was there in uh, late August, early September. And so it was the height of summer and the grasses were nearly as tall as me. And there was just innumerable flower species. And there were all these butterflies and all these insects and spiders. And it was just, I mean, it was just this amazing place. And then immediately outside of it, it's all just agriculture and like all of that life just boom, just drops off right there. Like, you know, I mean, farms are not uh, biodiversity hotspots for sure. No. Yeah, that's a great point. It is it is awe-inspiring in its own way. I've been on little segments of it, little sections of it for sure. And I, I find them really beautiful. I think uh, a lot of the thing that's also missing is the, the teeming wildlife of the megafauna that used to live out in these areas. So right. there's still plenty of creatures who do live out there, but yeah, we don't have the herds of buffalo and the wolf packs trailing them. Basically, you you check out the old accounts of settlers and stuff like that. And they're talking about how they see it all in one landscape. It's almost like a, a parody of what it would be, but it's like, no, it's all happening here. Here's the elk. It's, it's like the Serengeti today. It's like places in Africa where you can see basically this whole system of life playing out in one viewscape. That used to be what happened here. Yeah. 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 
it's a big loss. It's unfortunate. So yeah, there are all sorts of plants uh, that have been just replaced with other plants. And that's certainly a problem because of creatures can't live there. But what are some other drawbacks of farming every square inch of land in the U.S.? Right. Well, then there's how we treat the land, right? So, you know, one thing that we do is that we use lots of chemicals on it, you know, and it's true that organic farming has gotten to be more popular over the last few years and has really entered people's consciousness, but really organic agriculture is still in the single digits when it comes to the percentage of food that's in the market there. It's not, it's, 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 it's big business for a few players and it's, and it's great that it's, um, offering a, a livelihood for a lot of small farmers, but the vast majority of food is still not, you know, organically grown, right? And so you've got the chemicals that are that are put on are basically you've got two, you, you are sort of into two classes. You've got fertilizers and then you've got pesticides, right? So you're dumping one set of chemicals on the crops in order to make them grow better. And then there's another set of chemicals you're dumping out there to take care of various pests. And that's pests in the widest sense of the word. So that's insects, weeds, um, uh, fungal bacteria that might be a, a disease that might be growing on there, et cetera. You know? And so those two things both have a whole set of effects on their own. So a lot of people have heard about probably ocean dead zones, for example, right? Those are places in the ocean, uh, uh, usually at the mouths of rivers, you know, like there's one at the mouth of uh, uh, Columbia, out there in the Pacific Northwest, there's one in the Gulf, you know, by the Missouri, Mississippi, where it comes out and, and other places around the world. And so what happens is that the nitrogen fertilizer gets dumped on the fields. It, a lot of it washes into the waterways. It goes into the waterways and it's still working as a fertilizer. What happens then is that algae grows and overgrows basically. And so it grows, it starts, it start, and, and, and then when it dies and it decomposes, all the oxygen gets taken up, gets used up in that decomposition process, right? So then what we end up is we end up with waterways where the oxygen level is, is too low. This can be uh, a eutrophication, I think is, is one name for this, right? And so that is bad all along the waterways. And then it gets concentrated out there in the actual oceans, you know, as well. So that's just that's just fertilizers right there, and sort of one aspect of what they're what they're doing, you know, um, a, a sort of side effect uh, uh, of using the fertilizers too, like using the nitrogen fertilizers, is that uh, there are natural processes that happen in soils where there are bacteria in soils that cooperate with plants to produce nitrogen. I mean, that, that fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. So you've probably heard that like legumes are nitrogen fixing plants, for example, right? Beans are nitrogen fixing. So, so what happens is that, is that all sorts of different bean plants, uh, uh, they cooperate with a soil microorganism to take in nitrogen from the atmosphere and then they fix it in little nodules on their roots in the soil, right? So that nitrogen gets taken in from the atmosphere, put in the soil, and then it gets used by the plants that are there, right? Well, it turns out that the more that we put nitrogen, artificial nitrogen sources on the soil, the more that process isn't even happening anymore. Mm. So uh, that natural process also there is also like being, being stopped and being halted, right? So then if you go into an area and try to farm there later uh, and use organic methods, there's now something missing there that wasn't there before. You'll now have to figure out how to reintroduce this process. And I mean, you can, you can buy mycorrhizae, you know, that, that go with beans and add them to the soil. But I mean, that it, it's a lot of work, obviously. And, and, and it, 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 it would have been better if it was still, you know, if it was still just there, you know, so that that's fertilizers. Do you want me to go right into pesticides or? Yeah, sure. Okay. So, so pesticides, uh, I, pesticides, you know, are, are considered, you know, very, are sort of a scientific approach, you know, like they're chemicals that we've come up with in, in laboratories and that we apply, you know, out there in the field. And there's over a thousand different kinds of pesticides, uh, chemicals that are, that are used in the United States for agriculture. Now, once you combine these with each other and with other different, different, um, additives that they put in, there's actually over 20,000 different agricultural like pesticide products being used in the United States. So 
there's a lot of stuff getting dumped out there. And a lot of it hasn't really been tested or it's only been tested uh, on its own, not in combination with other things and not in combination with its additives. You know, uh, Glyphosate is probably the best known uh, pesticide. That's an herbicide. It's also known as Roundup. So it was uh, made by Monsanto originally. And glyphosate is just the active ingredient in the product Roundup. The product Roundup also contains other additives. Some of them are there to say, uh, help affix it to the leaves if it rains or you know this kind of thing, right? And, and to, to try to make it more effective. So a lot of times you'll hear about studies that Monsanto has had something to do with that say, oh, glyphosate isn't that bad. Well, they were only testing glyphosate all by itself in laboratory conditions, they weren't testing the actual product that they're putting out there. Because when you put the actual product out there, first of all, it's uh, hard to believe, and, and, but, I, but this is one of the things I discovered when I was doing my research, but when they apply pesticides, something like 1% to 10% actually hits the target. Mm. And the rest of it is just, just blows away, you know, or hits the ground or et cetera. You know, and then from the ground, it then gets washed into the into the soil. It gets washed into nearby waterways. If it's in the air, it blows over into an, an adjacent field. You know, it, it can you know go over the fence into a, a forest or whatever. I mean, so it doesn't stay in one place. So so we we put this there, and we're not just uh, affecting the farm plants, the you know our crop itself, but all these other things, right? So then once these um, different substances get out there into the environment, they start to, well, they're going to kill lots of plants. Of course, they're going to kill beneficial plants. They're going to, they're not going to be like, oh, here's a weed, but I'm going to leave this native plant here that this native butterfly wants. No, they're going to take out the native plant that the native butterfly wants to, right? Then a lot of these substances get into water and in waterways, especially is where a lot of these become bad. You've probably heard about different terrible things happening to frogs over the years, you know, with uh, hermaphrodism and, and et cetera, that can come up with them. Uh, that's one of the, one of the effects, you know, but uh, in the, in the waterways, they affect the insects, they affect the fish, you know, they affect, uh, and then, you know, I mean, you know, plants, the number one thing that gets affected first of all, but then the animals get affected because say you've, you've put this poison out there and it gets on the seeds of, of, of your crop and then you have some rodents that now eat it, right? Well, then those rodents, they just get eaten by a coyote or they get eaten by a bird, you know, a bird of prey, a raptor or whatever. And so it goes up the, it goes up the food chain like that, you know, because some pesticides are soluble in water and some are soluble in fats. So the ones that are soluble in fats those get stored in the animals and they get passed up the animal chain. And, you know, famous examples were uh, DDT in the 50s and 60s and how that was affecting bald eagles and almost brought the California condor to extinction. And I believe in the case of the condor, what was happening was that it wasn't killing the bird outright. What it was doing was making the shells thin. So they'd lay these eggs and the shells were too thin. And so then they weren't actually making it to, they weren't even, you know, uh, making it to the hatching stage. Yeah. Yeah. I, all this is really important to know because I think people don't tend to put all the pieces together and realize it's, it's easier to be like, okay, all of the environmental problems are the logging or just to be like, oh, it's all drilling. And, and those are all problems mining. Those are all issues. But the thing that's kind of happening under our noses is agriculture. So we talked about the habitat loss, chemical pesticides and fertilizers, of course, the impact on the human beings who are picking these fertilizers or applying oh, yeah. or, or the That's a big pesticides. Deal. And so a lot of migrant workers are really being uh, susceptible yep. to that, as well as the yep. people who apply it from the airplanes. And, and we've, uh, we've seen that with the timber industry out in the Pacific Northwest with this whole spraying of stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's really hard to hit your payload when you're dropping a liquid from hundreds of feet in the air. Like, uh, oh, yeah. It's, yeah. kind of, it's kind of Definitely. obvious, but that's a that's a crazy percentage of that. That's such a small percentage actually hits. So we have that element, but then we have, of course, soil erosion. So we're crapping up the soil, right, but right. then we're losing like literally goodbye right, right. to the soil. And there was a book I read many years ago called Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. And it was a, a mind opening book. It was it was phenomenal just talking about how, yeah, it is a 
it's a finite resource. I mean, in theory, it's renewable, but we're talking over hundreds of years and there's all this work, like you said, that we can do to improve soil. We should be doing that, but it's like, kind of like, oh, let's just plant trees. It's like, okay, but let's also preserve forests. So it's like, sure, let's recreate soil, right. but let's save the soil, the old growth soil, if that's a, a term, which it isn't. Right. Right. Yeah, so there's erosion. And then of course, what happens with erosion, but also just all of the tilling and all of the agricultural use, the industrial agricultural uses, all the carbon emissions going in the atmosphere. And we know that's a, that's a major driver of climate change. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the the Dust Bowl obviously is a famous instance of, you know, what happened, you know, as a result of of, of tilling, because that was, you know, the the, the prairies uh, of the of the middle of the United States, previous to, you know, the settler colonial invasion, where all I mean, the roots of those perennial grasses went down three six, nine, 10 feet. I mean, they went really deep, you know, and the sod was incredibly thick, you know, and, and, and so when they came in and they busted through all that the first time, there was a, a, a tremendous burst of fertility that they got off of that, you know, off of all that organic material getting broken down that had been building up for, you know, literally tens of thousands of years. Right. So there was a burst of that, but all of those roots have been holding the soil together you know, and then once they were gone, of course, you know, and, and they were using tractors, you know, as well, you know, and, and so they were really doing it on a mass, mass scale and, you know, very effectively. And so then, yeah, it did, it did literally start to blow away. And, you know, I was, I was going over some figures today and in um, preparation for this interview and um, uh, it takes um, to, to, for topsoil to replenish itself naturally, it happens at about the rate of three centimeters every 1,000 years. <laughs> uh, okay, wow. Right? So <laughs> it takes a while, right? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a long time. Well, what's yeah. an inch is like, what, two and a half centimeters or something? Okay, yeah. Right? So, okay. I see. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, for all effects and purposes, it is a finite resource. And yeah, it's no, it's, it's gone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember stopping at a rest stop in Iowa where they actually showed, uh, they had a, you know, um, there was a piece of artwork there that was like basically a big pole on it. You know, it had markings on the pole showing, you know, here was the depth of top topsoil when the pioneers arrived, you know, here is, you know, here it was, you know, 50 years later, here it is now. And like, yeah, it is gone. And you know, I, I guess the UN has has um, estimated that like half of the topsoil is going to be gone by 2050 or something. I mean, that's pretty intense. That's yeah. like, like, you know, it, it's it's like this crisis that we never talk about that we're right on the edge of, you know, is all this topsoil, you know, basically blowing away and washing away, you know, at all times. You yeah, know, that's, it's been happening for a that's while. That's a civilization ending <laughs> event, which I guess some people might welcome in some ways, but yeah, it would, it's not going to be a pleasant, pleasant way to go gradually starving or trying no. to figure out other ways or becoming dependent on other countries for all of our food. That's not something we want to have happen. So right. you, ta you talked about that there is, of course, a lot of a revolution in in small farming and organic, but that's still kind of just a, a blip on the radar. Well, maybe that's not fair to say a blip on the radar, but it is still a small percentage of what's going on nationally. Yeah, it is still a small percentage. Mm -hmm. and, and the UN has talked about how small farms that work like that actually acre for acre produce as much and in many cases more than conventional farming does. So it actually, it actually can work. It's just that it hasn't been profitable to the larger forces for that to happen. And I don't mean the larger forces in a conspiratorial sense. I just mean the people trying to make money who have a lot of money and can use that money to leverage it to, to eat everything up, you know, because as we've seen, and as I'm sure you know, that the number of small farms in the United States has been, you know, falling, you know, for decades now at this point, you know, I mean, you might remember when the farm aid concert started up in the, what, the eighties was that? I mean, so, so this, this crisis has been happening, you know, for a long time, you know, when you read in the media, when they talk about farmers, a lot of times they're not actually talking. I mean, they're not talking about who we mean anymore. When we think about farmers, old McDonald and the small holdings, you know, and the, and the small number of acres and a, a few cows and chickens. I mean, you know, usually when they say 
farmers at this point, they're really just referring to the agricultural industry. Yep. So they're referring to Archer Daniel Midlands and they're referring to ConAgra and they're referring to these to these big giants, you know? And even a lot of the individuals who still are farming out there don't own their land anymore. Now they're tenant farmers who are just working for these big corporations. So they're not even able to, to have that lifestyle that, that previously people did. Yeah, yeah, that's for sure. And one of the other pieces that we're seeing, and I don't know if you have any data on this, and it's fine if you don't, but we're converting more and more ag land to not just food crops, but energy crops. So that is, of course, right. greater stress. And it's like, hey, if we're going to fuck up the soil for something, it should at least be food first, not suggesting we continue to do it the way we're doing. But it's like that's going even further afield. It's like a field, so to speak. That's like huh. using vast acreage for a tiny percentage of, of energy use. And then, of course, a great deal of what is produced is actually feed for animals. So instead of growing food directly, right. it's this is feed. So this is, uh, I forget what they call the, the corn that they feed to pigs and, and whatnot, but it's not for human consumption. So you look at cornfields, you're like, well, at least they're growing corn as if corn is the most vital food anymore, which it's certainly not. Uh, but it, it's not even going to a human mouth. It's going to an animal. And so it's a very indirect way of uh, really misusing the land base. Yeah. Well, once you add together animal agriculture, like growing the, growing the growing the food for the animals and then the pasture space, and then you throw in the growing the crops for biofuels, the majority of farmland in the United States is now being used for that. Oh, so wow. it's, a, yeah, it's, it's less than half that's being used to grow food directly for, for people. Yeah, well, that's pretty telling. Uh, so in terms of, well, that's unfortunate. <laughs> so what, what that means is that we have some slack to play with. I mean, if you're looking for some hope, right? So, because we don't have to go out for biofuels, and we could eat less meat than we're eating, right? I mean, I think we eat more meat per capita than almost any country in the world. And historically, it's an anomaly as well. So, so even if it's, you know, the case that we need to eat meat to be healthy human beings, and obviously that's a whole other debate, but even if that's the case, we don't actually need to be eating as much as we are now, right? So, so we do have that slack to play with in the United States. We can reduce, you know, we, we, can, we can take some hits and still be producing enough food for people if we choose to focus our efforts in that way, you know, yeah. rather than holding up these industries or continuing to subsidize some of these sectors to the degree that we are, we need to probably, we need to move around some of those subsidies. For sure. And then another issue, of course, is the transportation of food, because, you know, I, I've lived places and people are like, hey, well, I'm eating all organic vegetables. It's like, yeah, well, guess what? Your, your lettuce came from California, you know, and if you're right. like 3,000 miles away and it's like, I'm all for uh, organic agriculture, but it's almost like there'd probably be less of an environmental impact to eat like pesticide soaked stuff from the next county than it would to be to drive stuff 3000 miles. And obviously there's a lot of middle ground between those two things. But I think sometimes we just don't, we uh, don't look at those externalities of all the transportation. So, so it's pretty crazy here in Colorado. Yeah, we're, there's not a ton of food grown here. So a lot of it is really brought in from elsewhere because uh, it's just the way it is. When I lived in the Pacific Northwest, a lot more was local food and same with Vermont. And something that was interesting about Vermont is, whereas over the past many years, of course, the, the farmers become older and older and they don't pass it down to the next generation, which is what kills the family farms in many ways. In Vermont, there became a whole culture, and there is in Oregon and a few places, if it's like where it's cool in certain circles to be a farmer again. Mm -hmm. So you can see young people in their 20s, men and women, and they're just coming back with their car hearts and they're all muddy and stuff like that. And then they go to the local brew, you know, brew pub for pizza or whatever. So that was becoming more and more of a thing. Do you, do you see that as more of a trend or has that peaked? What, what do you think about all that? I, I think that's still happening. I mean, I was, you know, part of that myself when I was an urban farmer in, in Portland. And then I was an organic farmer outside of Portland for a few years after that. And definitely was meeting more and more young people uh, doing it all the time. And I was in Oregon and in Washington uh, is where I was seeing this. And that really is a hotbed for that stuff, you know, in part because I mean, Oregon is just such an easy place to grow food. It really is. The climate is so nice. It doesn't get too hot. There's plenty of water. You know, it doesn't get too cold. You know, it's just, 
it's a really great place to grow food, you know, and, and I definitely saw that trend that you're talking about. And I follow, you know, people like that and news like that online still, and I'm still seeing it. I'm seeing, um, I'm seeing urban farming expand, you know, still, and I've been happy to see that the urban farming has been expanding to include more people of color as well, because that was not the necessarily the case, you know, before. And, uh, it, I, I think it's I think it's pretty exciting for that. I mean, that's all still very small scale. However, that is the next generations and what they want to do. And so, for that reason, we can we can definitely take a piece of of, of hope from that. Yeah, I've seen a little bit of that in the outskirts of Denver, some urban farming, and it is this particular farm is run by communities of color primarily. This it's that's the focus and that's the ownership of it, and. Yeah, when I lived in in Vermont, uh, it it was more and more a burgeoning thing, and I think I think like you're saying, it it is continuing, and I think it's really important. Of course, in rural areas, obviously, where all the land is, but in in urban communities, because urban cities are ugly, in my opinion. So anything <laughs> that can make the yeah. experience more enjoyable. And it's also a way of, unfortunately, a lot of people who live in the city, in particular poor people, they don't have the option of just going on a, to, out to the mountains for a hike all the time. They're not really in touch much with nature, so they're not going to care about nature because why would they? But all of a sudden you bring a little bit of nature and maybe this nature is literally just some raised bed gardens, but it's greenery, it's things growing. That's good enough. And in many ways, that could be more engaging than a walk in the forest because you're actually a part of that living process. And yeah, I used to work at an organic farm. I would get up, I was living in the woods at this little shack and I would get up at like 5.30 in the morning to be there and would work 10 hour days. And I, I remember I was getting paid six bucks an hour. It was definitely hard work, but it was pretty enjoyable mm -hmm. because everyone was cool there and we would hang out. And uh, yeah, it's uh, I, I, that was 20 years ago. So I, I'm hoping the pay is a little better than $6 an hour. But uh, I remember at the time though, the, the farmer, the guy who owned the place, and this was one of the larger organic farms in the Northeast, even he was, he told us, he's like, here's the deal. I make, I think he said like $25,000 a year on this or something like that. Right. Like, so I'm not getting rich off of this. I think people, we, we were complaining about our wages or something like that. I don't think I was, but uh, people were. And so he's just like, here, just, I'm going to be transparent. Here's the deal. So yeah, there isn't a ton of money in it. And it's so ironic because yeah, what do we value in our society? All sorts of other things. And then food is literally the top food and water, like literally the top of the list. And we're like, well, that doesn't count. You know, so there's, there's no way to really uh, do it's not an easy route to financial security. That being said, certainly there are plenty of farmers who are making a living. And I think as that, as that model grows and, you know, I know people just like my parents who over the last maybe 10, 15 years, never, never cared about organic before. And all of a sudden my mom was caring about it. She was still going to her grocery store, but then they did have some options for it. And so she's more and more was, trying to buy organic. So they're kind of my litmus test of where the, the mainstream world right. is. I'm like, all right, if my mom is caring about organic food, it's gotten a bit out in the mainstream. Of course, there is that issue of, okay, well now it's just these agribusinesses also growing some organic stuff on top of all the other damaging stuff that they're doing. So, but the problem is if you have the option of the big company, like, I don't know. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but the big company doing their carrots versus the local farm, that big company, they has all that, has all that money to sink into it. And, and frankly, will lower their prices to kill their competition. People are, if they see, oh, this is 30 cents higher, they're not going to pay it. And a lot of people, because they literally can't afford it, but a lot of other people can, and are just like, nah, I'm going to, I don't want to spend an extra $5 a week to preserve a whole uh, living ecosystem. It just doesn't, doesn't occur to people. So wh what do you, th what do you think is the, the trend for that in the future? Well, I think small scale is where it has to go, you know? And I think that policy wise, we need to stop, uh, we need to stop subsidizing the larger operations, you know, and I don't know all the ins and outs of exactly how all those subsidies work. I can't get into all those details for you, but you know, a lot of those industries are held up, you know, I mean, they're, 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 they're propped up by the, the money that they're getting 
you know, from, from federal subsidies, you know, and in some cases, you know, also from, from, from state, state subsidies, you know, and then the little folks, you know, with those smaller operations really are uh, the only ones who are in the free market in that sense, you know what I mean? Who really are just trying to, to scramble, you know, and scrap on their own. And, you know, the reason that I'm not an organic farmer anymore myself is just because I could never find land, you know, yeah, sure. and, I couldn't find, I mean, it's uh, the land prices are still out of reach. You know, there was never really a crash on rural land prices in 2008, like there was for housing, you know, and housing in the meantime has gone back up, of course, as we know. And, you know, finding uh, people to, finding a landowner that you could cooperate with, also very difficult, you know, uh, just for, for the different reasons that cooperation is, is difficult. And, and as someone who's been an activist, I know you know all about this, right? So <laughs> we don't need to get into all of that, right? You know, And so that's part of an issue too, is like, how do we get land access to people who want to do this? Because for the people who are willing to put in the 10 or 12 hour days and not make much money, right? Okay, what can we do for these people, yes. you know, so that they can be doing a better, a better job, you know, you know, and then, you know, in, in the background of this, you know, too, is just, we also need to keep an eye on organic standards, you know, and organic standards, as we know them started from in Oregon, actually, there was a group of farmers there. Um, I met some of them when I was farming there. Harry McCormick is one of them who's well known there at Sunbow Farm. And they were like, back to the landers, hippies, you know, really from the 60s, early 70s. And they're the ones who first started the organic movement in Oregon. And so Oregon TILF existed as a certifying agency before there was a federal standard. And Oregon TILF was one of the agencies that they looked at what they were doing when they wanted to set the federal standards, you know. And so the, you know, the Department of Agriculture has the National Organic Program, NLP, standards that they set. And the, that didn't actually get decided and set in stone until I believe it was 2001 or two. So official organic is actually pretty new. And like a lot of other um, regulatory or programs like that that get put in by the federal government, uh, from day one, they started to get watered down. <laughs> Right. So, so, so really the organic program was the very best. It was going to be that first day that it was in there. And then since then it started to go, oh, yeah. started to go down, you know? So for example, hydroponics can now be considered organic, you know, and that was, you know, well, what's the big deal? Well, organic was, 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 uh, was primarily about soil health right. to begin with. How do you have healthy soil? Well, hydroponics isn't even using soil mm -hmm. and it's using a bunch of plastic tubes, you know, and then you need all, you need electricity to run pumps, to run the water through that. And then, you know, any of the nutrients you're giving them need to be in liquid form. So that's a whole processing thing that's happening. So even if it's organic, it still is something that needs to be manufactured in a factory. I mean, you know, that that's kind of where we've gotten at this point. Organic standards also don't include, um, don't include uh, labor standards at all which you'd alluded to before when we were talking about the, the, the pesticides, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you can have an organic farm, you know, where you're, you know, paying someone, you know, uh, you're paying someone who, who's undocumented here, like, you know, a couple of dollars an hour, you know, or you're paying them, you know, at a, a piece rate. A lot of agricultural workers work at like, you know, like blueberry farmers, you know, mm -hmm. workers, you know, you're paid for every pound you bring in or whatever, you know? So like, you know, that kind of thing, you have to be really good at it to actually make a, a, a decent amount. So, so those people get taken advantage of, and that's not included in organic standards either. So there's that whole end of it there. So is organic better than conventional? Absolutely. You know, is it, is it the whole deal? No. Is it something we need to keep an eye on to make sure that it doesn't get watered down to nothing? Absolutely. You know, and with, uh, um, Vilsack in there as the, uh, as the, uh, new secretary of agriculture under Biden, not not a that's not that's not a good that's not a good sign <laughs> no no he, he's a real big fan of of, of gmos you know oh, he, yeah. he's, he's he's a big fan of uh, a big a big friend of monsanto he uh hasn't actually been friendly to uh to small small farmers to small agriculture we know all of this because he was the department he was the uh he, he was he was the he had the same position in Obama's administration. So yeah. we already know his track record. We already oh, know what he, I mean, there's no mystery here. He was brought back in to do that, you know? And we didn't mention GMOs at all. Did you want to 
get into that for a minute or? Sure. Yeah. But before we do, I just want to, you brought up a couple of the other uh, problems with agriculture. Of course, we could do hours on the problems with agriculture. Yeah, I know. Could be comprehensive. <laughs> so groundwater issues, right? So there's depletion of groundwater. Right. right. That's, and then uh, the future pandemics that we're creating from a lot of these factory farms, primarily pigs, but also right. you name it across the board, poultry and livestock. And so they, they think they don't know for a fact, of course, but uh, w- for H1N1, that that might have come from pig farming down in Mexico. Who knows? It might have come from pig farming in the U.S. But you, the U.S. seems like it's almost more the ground zero for a lot of emerging pandemics. It's happening right here. So again, it, it's like, all right, I'm going to care about an issue. Which issue am I going to work on? And it's like a lot of people like agriculture, you know, whatever. Well, agriculture is so central to to these things. So yeah, let's talk a little bit about GMOs and then maybe let's go into some root stuff that I know you want to bring up. Sure, sure. Well, I, I think the GMOs are really important to bring up because there are uh there is there is division about this and there are people who are, you know, technophiles, you know, who are big fans of science, you know, who are otherwise, you know, maybe progressive or whatever, who are in favor of GMOs because they're science, you know? And well, you know, GMOs, what what a great idea. We can go in and and and, and breed these plants faster than we've been able to breed them before, you know, more effectively, you know, because th- the reason the GMO came about is because plant breeding is ordinarily a rather slow process, you know? You're like, you know, you, you grow two things next to each other, you let them flower and pollinate each other, you collect the seed, you plant the seed out, you know, the next year. And, and maybe with some plants, you can do this twice in a season, but you know, it, it takes years, literally years to like breed things. Now I'm going to select for the trade I want. I'm going to, you know, pull out the ones that I don't want, rogue them it's called, you know, uh, and, and, and that takes a while. So with, with GMO, what they're doing is they're going in to the actual genes themselves and being like, okay, we think that if we take this section of genes out, you know, or put this other one in, in that this is what will happen, you know, and it's not an exact science. Uh, they, 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 they bring a, a chain in. They don't know. I mean, they don't know fully everything that's going to happen from that. You know, they do do experiments. It is faster. That's the main advantage to it. And the excuse so far for this technology has been that, well, uh, we'll get higher yields, you know, but of all the GMO crops that exist so far, uh, none of them have actually been modified specifically for higher yields. The, the two most common reasons that they've modified crops so far has been to make them uh, Roundup resistant, resistant to, to pesticide application, yeah. and to make them actual producers of insecticide. Yeah. So you've heard of BT corn. Mm-hmm. You probably heard of BT corn, right? Yes. So BT that's uh, I can't remember what BT stands for. It's it, that's it's the name of a particular bacteria, yep. but it's a bacteria which kills basically butterflies and moths. It kills the larvae caterpillars of butterflies and moths mm-hmm. uh, indiscriminately too. Not just you know bad ones, but you know it does affect say the monarch butterfly. That's why the monarch butterfly was used as a emblem of a lot of people who were fighting BT corn a few years ago because BT corn was genetically modified to produce this toxic bacteria in its actual self. So all parts of the plant, the leaves, the the pollen, et cetera, all contain this toxin, Mm -hmm. you know, which then kills any, any, any caterpillar or larvae that that comes on there, you know, and it can kill other insects as well. Right. So that's a big one just because there's so much damn corn that's grown in, in 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 the country right now. Right. I mean, it's, it's a huge crop. Right. So, so there, you know, the excuse was, oh, well, now we won't be spraying insecticides on because the corn's growing its own insecticides. But when you actually measure how much how much of this, this toxin is being produced by the corn, it's actually producing more of that toxin on site than would have been applied. Yeah. So it actually made the problem worse. And no, it's not actually producing more corn. It's just a corn that produces this, this toxin, right? And then the second one that's the big one has been the, the Roundup resistance, you know? Mm-hmm. So- these are so Roundup is a is a is a herbicide. It, kill, it kills plants. It kills broad broadleaf plants, and no, it kills. I think it kills plants across the board, not just broadleaf plants. And so what they did was they bred. They they used the genetic engineering to make forms of corn and soy, specifically, and other ones. I think maybe also cotton, so that you could spray the Roundup on them, and it wouldn't kill them. 
it would kill all the other plants in the field, but not them, right? right? So it would kill all the weeds, anything that was coming up around them, but then it would leave the it would leave the your crop intact. So uh, the introduction of Roundup Ready corn and, and soy in the early 2000s tracks with uh, a sudden decline in monarch butterflies because what happened was a lot more milkweed was getting killed. Sure. It's as simple as that, is that something like 80% of the monarch butterflies in the Eastern and Central migration, as opposed to the West Coast one, you know, uh, were getting their sustenance from the milkweed, from milkweed in fields or yeah. alongside fields. Right. So they were depending on the fact that the farmers were not getting rid of all the milkweed in order to survive, right? So, I mean, that's just one example. Obviously there's, you know, you, you're, you're taking out that much more plant life in and around the fields. So there's other, you know, there's other animals, obviously, and insects that are being affected too. That's just the one that stood out because it's such an iconic, you know, an iconic creature. And uh, because over time, a lot of weeds like pigweed, amaranth, for example, tends to uh, um, become Roundup resistant itself, they have to start using more Roundup in order to kill it. And eventually they had to start bringing in other herbicides mm -hmm. now because now the Roundup isn't working. So, okay, what's happened since the, the GMO revolution of the late 90s, early 2000s is that we are now using more pesticides than we were using before. <laughs> yep. And we don't have higher yields than we did before. We are promised higher yields and lower pesticide use. The yields have not improved. Pesticide use has gone up. It's, it's, it's a scam and it makes some people money and that's what it's doing. Yeah. Well, basically the whole GMO thing, it seems to be about avoiding what root causes are. So basically they're like, okay, well, first of all, if we're not producing enough food in an efficient manner, like, well, ignoring the fact that we're wasting all this food, ignoring the fact that which crops we grow, ignoring all this other stuff, they're like, let's tinker with the plant and literally do a science fiction experiment, which I write horror. And like, what's more horrific <laughs> than creating a plant that creates its own poison? Like, come on, man. Right. And even if, even if a GMO modified pineapple is proven to be safe right now, we don't know if that's true, but let's just say it is like, we don't really know what we're doing with, with the tinkering process, but that aside, the point that you're making is like, no, no, they're, they're creating a lot of these so we can spray more poisons on them. So whether the organism themselves is safe, which is debatable and debatable about whether we'll take over other other organisms and out compete right. them. There's all the, there are all those issues, but ultimately all of it just seems to be this, this flawed thinking, this unwillingness to kind of be like, okay, let, let's go back to square one. And what are we trying to accomplish here? Where did things go wrong, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go way back, like further back than right would even necessarily be relevant to what we can deal with right now, but just to understand uh -huh. how did, how did things change? So in your opinion, when we started as in humans started focusing on agriculture as the way to subsist, that that was a major change, not just in our land use, but just in civilization as a whole. Right. Well, it, depending on how you were used the word civilization, it invented civilization. I mean, uh, literally speaking, civilization is city-based existence, city-based societies, you know, uh, civilization that's civis from the, the Latin word for, for city, right? So, so in some sense, civilization can be said to be a result of agriculture, right? So previous to that, it was, you know, we had human societies and cultures, but not technically civilization. I mean, it, it's a confusing word because of course we also use the word civilized to be like, oh, well, that's a good thing. That's people being nice to each other and stuff, you know? I, I mean, it's funny because of course, within the context of civilization, we're actually not nice and as nice to each other, but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so, so the, it's, it's, it's still mysterious exactly why the agricultural revolution, also called the Neolithic revolution began. We don't really know why, we know when. We know that it began about, all, the very earliest roots of it go back to about 11,500 years ago. So the, we've had a series of, of ice ages on the planet, right? Well, we've, had, we've been in a single ice age for 
uh, a few million years now with periods of more and less glaciation, right? So if you go back, say, 25 or 30,000 years, 50,000 years ago, there was a lot of ice on the planet, right? That's when we had the glaciers coming down into Iowa and, you know, and, and, and covering Northern Europe and et cetera, right? So, so we had these colder periods, right? And the human race has been around for 200,000 years. We've seen several of these periods you know, come and go. And we've moved around and responded to it in different ways and et cetera. But at the end of the, so about 20,000 years ago is when the last period of glaciation began to recede. And by about 12,500 years ago, it had really warmed to uh, a climate that's pretty much like the one we have now. And this is kind of what they call the Holocene age, you know? So, and, 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 and there was a brief period of time between, I want to say, of, of about 1,200 years after it warmed back up, where it rapidly got cooler again for 1,000 years and then warmed back up again. It's called the, 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 um, the Lesser Dryas period. You might have heard of it. Dryas, D-R-Y-A-S. And that's just named after a plant that happened to do well during that period that they find in, in, their, in their digs when they study this period. So there was a, the, the, the planet warmed up. And there was this period of stress that happened. And then it was shortly after that, that agriculture emerged. So we know that there was a set of historical events where things were changing. Now, one thing that was changing during that time was that when you look at plants, you know, you've got perennial plants and annual plants, right? So perennials is like a tree, you know, or a shrub or a rose bush, you know, whatever. And annual is like, you know, a carrot, you know, or a wheat or, or something like that, right? Well, Plants, the default for plants is perennials. Uh, they, they default to perennial. Plants tend to throw out annual forms during periods of stress because an annual form is, 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 comes and goes in one year, can produce seeds, throw them down. So they're like, oh, things are crazy right now. Let me make a bunch of seeds on a really frequent basis so that, you know, putting this material out there, I can, I can deal with it. That's, that's what the plant's doing to survive, right? Mm -hmm. So it's true that uh, there were a lot of perennial grain plants at that point that threw out annual forms. These turned out to be a lot of the forms that we then domesticated, right? So, so again, did we domesticate them just because they were there? I, I mean, who knows, but we did. And, and, and what we saw over then over the next few thousand years, so from about 11,000 years ago to about 6,000 years ago, what we saw during that period was a gradual period of change where more and more people in the Mideast area uh, went from a migratory gathering and hunting lifestyle to a more sedentary lifestyle, where first they were in little villages, you know, and then later on they were in, in, in larger settlements, you know. And at first, what happened was that it was a very, it was not really what we call farming, but more what we would call gardening, you know. And in, you know, uh, in academic terms, you would refer to that as horticulture versus agriculture, right? So it was horticulture kind of that we got into at first, right? And at this point, a lot of it was also what you could call uh, horticulture can also be called stick agriculture. So like it's 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 people, and at this time it seemed mostly women using sharpened sticks, maybe fire hardened at the end, and they would use these to uh, make holes in the ground and put seeds in, and and then to harvest things. Now similar tools had been used by gatherers for thousands of years previous to that for digging up wild roots, you know? So that was already a tool that we had, the sharpened stick. And also kind of tending those wild plants, right? So there was that crossover also, period, maybe, maybe weeding in a sense, stuff that there was. Really occurs. That's right, that's right, yeah. And, and, so, and, so, and so, so then, so we, we got into that. So then there was a period of, 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 of slow transition at that point. And what we've noticed from the fossil record from that time uh, are, are a few things. Uh, one, human health actually declined during this period. So people became shorter, uh, bone density became less, uh, tooth health, uh, dental health began to decline. It's very interesting. And it seems that, it seems that um, uh, uh, and, 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 and people just got more diseases as well. Now, at the same time this is happening, people were also starting to domesticate animals, right? And they were living in close quarters with animals. And so this is the beginning of zoonotic diseases, of diseases jumping from animals to people, you know? It doesn't seem like this really happened very much in the wild before that. It yeah. seems like this was uh, this was a function of, you know, 
oh, now we're living with these sheep and we're all living under literally one roof, <laughs> right? Like, so, <laughs> so, so, you know, there, there's, you know, maybe it's called chicken pox for a reason, you know, because it originally came from, you know, swine flu it originally had, you know, an origin in, in pigs, you know? Yeah. So, so a lot of these early communities, you know, we, we got these diseases and a lot of these early communities then got wiped out, you know? Yeah. During this period, uh, we see archaeologically, we can see that communities would come up and then they would do for Wawa and then they, and then they would crash. Mm -hmm. We saw this, you know, disease seems to be part of it, but also, uh, you know, there were seasonal things, maybe a drought would come in or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. and, our, and our health was also affected by the fact that our diet was now less varied than it was before. So when we were in a wild setting and we were eating different things that were in season at different times of year and in different places, because we're also moving around, you know, um, we were eating, you know, well over a hundred different plants or something like that. Well, we started to farm and, you know, we started to eat a lot less than that. I mean, you know, I don't think, I mean, I wonder if I eat a hundred different plants in a year at this point. I mean, <laughs> you know, different species. I mean, right. I'm, I'm not sure. Right. And so, so, so even with everything that we have available to us. And so that was, that was something that, that happened, you know, too. And we also know that from the stress that the bodies, the, 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 the stress that the bodies show that people were working harder and that they were working longer hours as well. Yeah. So it was really kind of a bad deal. It wasn't really, we didn't have an immediate improvement. This is why the question of why is so fascinating because it didn't actually lead to an improvement uh, in our existence at all. Now, eventually what happened was, was that, was that, um, the, the, well, the other thing to mention is that these early, the early societies previous to, to horticulture, and then the early horticultural societies were still fairly egalitarian, uh, between the sexes, because the, in, in the, in the pre-agricultural societies, you have women predominantly doing the gathering and men predominantly doing the hunting, right? And, when it comes to gathering versus hunting, gathering is actually more dependable than hunting is, you know? Like it's more dependable to be able to find a good stand of plants, to know when to come back for them every year. They're gonna be in the same place, you know? You can get to know them than, than animals who it's, it's a little more, I mean, you can try to follow herds and this sort of thing, but still you go out, you don't know that you're gonna bring something back, you know? And you don't know how much you're gonna bring back, right? And so, the communities, the way that they, they, the food that they were eating, they were um, just as, if not more dependent on the food that was being produced by, by the women than the men, right? So in a setting like that, okay, everything's, everything's pretty equal. There's not anybody who's over anybody else there. Cause okay, we all need each other here. You know, like we obviously can't depend on just what the dudes are bringing back. Cause sometimes they go out and they don't bring back anything. I'm like, Oh, but whenever we come back and we don't have anything, Oh, there's still food for us here. Isn't there? Right. So <laughs> that was part of what was happening. Right. Mm -hmm. So then you get into the horticultural societies. That's where that, that starts to, starts to change, you know, a little bit. And then at some point they uh, hooked up, plows to animals, to oxen, and you needed a, a person to steer that. And that became men's work at that point to steer the plow behind the oxen. At that point, women sort of lost a lot of their role in food growing and gathering and, and, and became more, more stay at home, you know, at that point. So now they didn't really have as much to, to contribute. You know what I mean? That's where a lot of the, this, this is where, this is kind of the beginning of, of, of inequality. Uh, between between the sexes is, 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 is with that, you know? The other yeah. piece from my mm -hmm. research is that the gods went from the female fertility gods right. prior to that, where it's about the plethora of nature and all right. the abundance to these kind of more male masculine gods, yep. like almost kind of a polytheism, multiple gods to kind of one god of the plow. And of, of course, uh, obviously that is going to be a way of then diminishing the role of females and uh, women compared to males uh, and men. But there's a, another argument is that it's a way of basically tricking men into basically destroying their bodies to pull that heavy ass plow. Because of course, if you're going to pick somebody to pull the plow, it's going to be the, the stronger ones, the ones who are not, who are not providing the, uh, the children. So you have the men doing it. And so that what you do is you give them this male God to look up to. It's like, you be like that. You, 
And so they, they kind of sacrificed themselves to the plow. So of course, then males became more elevated, but at the same time, your average male was basically killing himself to, to do that really rough work, which yeah, like you said, is not even necessarily there, there must've been some level of stability that wasn't there before, perhaps, because you have to wonder, like it would have at least have benefited in the short term, the production of children, maybe to, because there had to have been a, a reason why they would adapt to something that ultimately the long term would be bad. So maybe in the short term, but like you said, we don't know. We don't really know. People have been arguing about that for over a yeah, hundred we not gonna, <laughs> We're not going to know for sure, but I just thought yeah. how they shifted the gods was a really interesting thing as well says a lot. I, I hadn't heard that particular thing that you just said. I think that's very interesting. And it's definitely true that as we went from the gathering, hunting, and then into the farming and full civilization, we went, you know, basically from an animism and, a, and kind of a polytheism to a monotheism. That just, it really stands out how we went into the monotheism. That's without a doubt, you know, what happens there. And you look at the monotheism that, you know, look at the, you know, look at the Abrahamic tradition, right? Which, you know, uh, spawned, um, uh, Judaism and Christianity and Islam, right? So a, a sizable percentage of, of the religious people in the world today, right? And right there in the creation myth, you've got God, you know, a single God, you know, giving humans dominion over creation, you know? They own the plants and the animals. They can do with the earth what they want. I mean, whoa, you know? Yep. So I think that, you know, th those, those, those stories as we have them in the Abrahamic, you know, tradition, those were written down starting it's my understanding around 600 BC or so during the, the Babylonian exile, when a lot of the Israelites were, had been captured and were living in Babylon. That's when they started to write down a lot of their stories is my understanding. And that's when they picked up like the flood myth and that kind of thing too, because they picked up other stories mm. from that time. And, and yeah, and, and the, in these books, you know, they were differentiating themselves and their cultures from people around them, around themselves. And, and, yeah, and they declared this dominion, and that really describes agriculture pretty well. Uh, in, in 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 contrast to the to the previous gathering and uh, gathering, which did include the wild tending as well, which was a, a reciprocal relationship right. that was or a cooperative relationship that was then replaced with uh, a dominating relationship. And so, basically, we had kind of three things happening, you know, at at, at once there. In that in that arena, which was that we had the woman uh, um, subjugated in the home by the man, then we had women in general being subjugated by men in the culture, and then we had Mother Nature itself being subjugated by agriculture and by civilization. You know, so when we talk about these, are, these are kind of the three expressions of patriarchy that came out of that out of, out of that period. You know. And I mean, I, I think it's fascinating to look at that and to see how far back patriarchy goes, you know, and, and you can look at the laws that came about in those early agricultural days, you know, from the Sumerians and stuff like, well, now, now we're a little bit, not quite as far back, like uh, 2500 BC, for example, you know, uh, at that time it was legal, you know, for uh, if a uh, if a, if a wife disagreed with her husband, he was allowed to, you know, uh, um, uh, a smash in her teeth with a brick, you know, this was a law that was on the books. I mean, you know, and, and, and if you look back through the writing of that time, and you know, too, we see that the word for female slave appears before the word for male slave does by like a couple centuries or something like that. So it's very interesting to look at, look at this and see how the subjugation in a general sense of the feminine by the masculine was 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 began then was a trend that started then that obviously still um haunts us you know to this day well yeah i i think there are many threads to investigating the whole thing and i think all of them are definitely fascinating and i i think the one thing that for sure we have at least fossil records of it's hard in culture we don't ever know for a fact about the right. gods like we, we we have a general understanding of that but we don't but we do know that the landscape the our interaction with the landscape changed at that point and since then it's all been in a sense downhill so the question is okay well we're probably not going to be 
well, let's let's say we wanted to go back to all hunter gathering. Guess what? We don't get to. There's not enough land left for it. So it's literally not an option. Like I, I've talked about this before on the podcast. Now I, I don't eat deer personally, but uh, mostly because I think chronic wasting disease is going to be jumping over to humans soon. But uh, anyway, that's a whole different issue. But um, people are like, hey, I go out there and hunt my deer. I'm like, well, that that's cool. You're you're hunting your own food. That's excellent. And like, yeah, more people should do it. It's like, well, if we all did that, there'd literally be zero deer. Like there are not enough deer in North America. So it's fine for some people to do that, but it's not a solution for us anymore compared to the way it was for tribes where you can be dependent on the deer and the elk herds. That was just, you could survive because there were not a ton of uh, human beings. So we don't have the option of that in terms of wildlife. We can fish, but again, there's still finite fish. And then certainly we can't just go around gathering foods from the forests that barely exist anymore. There's just not enough to go around. So what what do we do? <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, obviously there's literally no going back, you know? I mean, there's just literally no such thing as that. I wish you know? we could, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, for, for, all, for, all, for all the reasons that you mentioned, you know, uh, I still think... I think that it's before I, I talk about where where to go. I, I would say that there's still um, value in knowing how we got here. Oh yeah, and 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 the mistakes that we made in 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 the same way that it's good to understand uh, one's own trauma, one's own trauma. You know what I mean? Like you know, I mean physical or emotional or whatever. You know what I mean? Like you know, I, I mean I, I fell on the ice. You know, when I was uh, going to college in Minnesota in 19. 87 and hit my hip really hard. It hurt for like six weeks. And you know what? I can still feel it sometimes. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, like, like it's there, it's still part of me. You know what I mean? Like, so, so that's the thing is that, is that the past is, is, you know, not merely prologue, the past is present. It's here. You know what I mean? And so, so, so that's part of it is, is to, is to, to get a better perspective on our times and to be like, okay, wait a minute. This all feels normal to us. This all feels like, the way it should be. This all feels somehow inevitable, you know? And yet, if we look at how we got here and what we've done, we can see that, well, okay, there were other options. You know what I mean? Like, 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 there, like, you know, the, the, what we did and what we did can't be undone. However, we need to look at what we did in order to know even how to go forward, you know, from here, you know, yeah. because it's not just about our choices. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 you know, it's not just about our choices. It's about, about our values and the values that drive those choices, you know, as well, you know? And so the actual logistics of how it's going to look, well, the actual logistics of it is that obviously we're still going to be depending on farming and farmed food for some time, you know, to come, you know, uh, we can change what that looks like, you know, we can change what that looks like in some really big ways, you know, that could really make a difference. Do you know what I mean? Like how that's going to, I mean, policy wise, that's a really hard one because how do you drive that? I mean, you know, okay, we got the orange menace out. We've got the good guy in, but look who we put to put in charge of agriculture. Okay, well, it doesn't look like a good four years for that, right? So, <laughs> so that's that. That's not that's not the route, right? You know, and and as you know, and as you've discussed on on this podcast, you know, on under other subjects, you know, there's a certain, um, I mean, individual actions only have so much, so much effect. You know what I mean? Like. It's not, you know, I mean, you or I can stop driving and, and only bike around, you know, but someone else is going to use that gas. Right. I mean, you know, until we have a, a, some kind of larger, you know, change like that, you know. So, I mean, you know, being that the only thing we have is individual choice, we still have to make the best individual choices that we can. Yeah. And we have to talk about this stuff with other people, you know, and it makes a difference for our, ourselves as well, you know to have these different experiences, you know? And to, I mean, there's not enough out there for everybody to go out and forage, but there are things that we can do to help preserve that land and preserve those resources so that that foraging can come back, you know? I mean, uh, you know, getting all the cattle off of public lands would be a really good start. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> right, you know, because, uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, uh, foraging in the forest. Forests, mature forests are actually one of the poorest ecosystems for food, you know. It's actually 
um, uh, post fire landscape for a few years in a forest is great for food. That's when you're going to have, you know, a lot of your annuals to have seeds you can eat. That's when you're going to have your berry bushes. That's when you're going to have some of your roots coming in, you know, but places like the Great Basin, you know, are really full of food, you mm -hmm. know, it's just not something that you, 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 you see unless you know how to look for it. You know, that's one of the things I've learned about the last few years, you know, more, you know, and so uh, whatever it is that we can do to preserve any of these, these spaces is, is, is really, is really important. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And anything we can do to make, make, make more people aware. I mean, there's also just the matter of, of no, we can't force a change right now, but a change is coming. Sure. Like a change is coming, you know, yeah. like we had those massive floods in the Midwest, um, year before last, I can't remember, but that had a big effect on the harvests that year. There was a lot that never got planted. Right. Sure. You know, and there was those, this last year, there were those amazing, uh, derecho winds that went through Iowa and knocked down, you know, thousands of acres of, of, of crops. It was enough that you could see it from satellite pictures, these huge swaths in the Iowa landscape, you know? So the thing is, is that, is that, um, uh, we might not, we might not have the, the the stomach or whatever, you know, or the political will or whatever to 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 change things, but these things will be changed for us. So nice. the sooner that we get out of our own ways of thinking about this now, and the sooner we start thinking about what to replace it with and try to work on these things, the better. Because it's gonna happen. It'll 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 be here at some point, you know, whether ConAgra wants it or not, you know, that <laughs> They're just not going to get their way. Monsanto's not going to keep getting their way. Mother Nature's going to get her way. So how can we be on the right side of that one? You know. Yep. And it seems like the way forward can be with the it's it's a lot of scale stuff. So instead of these giant monocrops that completely basically erase uh, an ecosystem, we could be doing, you know, a diversity of crops, of course, is beneficial to the crops and the soil and whatnot in terms of pests, etc. But also, it could be a little more blended into the natural ecosystem. So we can have, let's say, if there is some sort of grassland here, and then there's, okay, well, we can convert a lot of this farmland back to grassland, but then some of it obviously is going to stay as ag land. If we do a little bit of that staggered approach, we can start kind of returning a little bit to this is just all ag land, and then over there is the forest or whatever. We we can start blending it too, you know. So of course, permaculture concepts uh, are, I think, the way of the future. And they do they do take a lot of mindfulness though, and they're not as profitable in terms of the bottom line initially. But I think that's how we can move forward. And I think the more people have appreciation of that that's going to be the market forces. They're like, I want to know that my food is coming from a place where, yeah, it's like, as I'd picture it, like, you know, a farmer in the Dow, like, oh, look at, look at the nice pieces of landscape. That's not just a pretty picture. That's an ecological benefit. So it's possible that we can do that. And there are models for that. We have to, I think, keep creating the models and we need to be talking about it and writing about it like the way you're doing. So yeah, you're on the leading edge of putting that out there. And I, I think that's awesome. Do you have any uh, any final words for our listeners on the topic? Yeah, the, the one more thing I would say on that topic of of how to how to go forward or what we should do is that it's not um, it's not as though all humans who gather and hunt are gone from the face of the earth at this point either. There is still a small number of people sure. left who are living these lifestyles. I mean, some in South America, you know, some in different parts of Asia, Africa, and some in the United States as well, you know, especially as you go further west than the United States, you'll find tribes who were not simply taken and forced off of their land like they were back east, you know what I mean, but whose ancestral lands were reduced. So they are still able to live some aspects of that of that, of that, that former life before. And so, and so um, they, uh, there are still indigenous people, in other words, for us to look to, who are still keeping some of these things alive, not just the practices, but also the values, you know? And so that's really important too, is for us to support that because ultimately that's where it goes, you know? So, so they are the seed 
that will eventually grow into to, to what happens under some set of circumstances. You know, I did a, a podcast a, a few weeks ago with um, a man in, um, who grew up on the Umatilla Reservation in, in, in Oregon, who is working on these things in Eastern Oregon, you know, yeah. and, you know, he, he's, he's, um, he, he, he got a great job working um, at uh, uh, an Episcopalian uh, summer camp in Eastern Oregon, of all things, right, where the Episcopalians decided, oh, that doctrine of discovery thing, that was really bad. We're reputed, we're reputed, you know, we're, we're, we're rejecting that, you know, we want to see how we can now offer reparation to Native Americans. And so they hired this guy to be like, hey, we've got like, you know, 80 acres here or whatever. How about you start, you know, switching that back to something it should be. So he's actually out there. He's being, he's, he's, he's getting a salary and some place to live with his family, you know, with his, with his wife and his kid. And I'm, I'm, I'm friends with them. I've been friends with them for a few years now. And, you know, this year they brought the, uh, the camas root bake back into that Valley and had it there for the first time in a hundred years, you yeah. know? Very so cool. it's like, wow, here's an actual reversal happening of the bad things that happened. So, so I think it's important for us to remember that there are still a few, you know, uh, there, there was someone who went to the spoken at the UN in the 90s who was an indigenous person. And she said, we represent only 1% of the world's population, but 99% of the knowledge of how to live on the globe sustainably. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good way to put it. And yeah. so so that that's where I would leave it is that is that at this point, uh, uh, we shouldn't just be looking at ourselves uh, and, and what, you know, for, for solutions, we need to be looking to the indigenous, for examples at this point. Yeah. The folks who had figured out how to live in balance, uh, right. that's the closest we've ever come as humans to really like having our proper place in the world. It seems like, so uh, yeah, I totally agree with that. That's, that's a great point to end on. And is there a spot where people can check out any of your work? Well, if they go to, I've got a blog and from there you can find my podcasts and stuff. It's called Max Gamoksha Press and you'll have to write this down in the show notes for people. It's M-A-C-S-K-A-M-O-K-S-H-A.com, maxgamoksha.com. And that's where my blog is. Uh, a lot of the stories that I write end up getting published on Counterpunch too, uh, sometimes in, in Resilience. And um, uh, you can, uh, I've got an unusual name, so it's easy to find me on any of the social media platforms. So. Cool. And we'll definitely have at least one link up on the description. So you can just click on that and you'll have to learn how to spell or anything. So, uh, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. We're talking about this super important issue. Thanks. I really appreciate it, Josh. I'm really a big fan of your podcast. So it was an honor to be on here. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.